Okay, perfect. So maybe I, I start with the introduction and people, uh, people. So welcome everyone to today's uh, afternoon session, the final session of today's, uh, uh, today's workshop. And our first speaker is Professor Jian Feng Liu from Duke University. And he's going to speak about uh, error analysis for high dimensional elliptic PD on neural networks. Jian Feng, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, so before I start, I want to thank the organizers for putting together such a wonderful workshop. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person, and it's also a bit hard for me to uh, adjust the time zone to watch all the talks, but I've been uh, watching videos, and uh, there have been very nice uh, discussions. So uh, what I'm going to share with you today is some uh, recent line of work, together with my student Zhang Chen at Duke, and also a former postdoc Yu Lu, who is now a uh, tenure track professor at uh, Massachusetts, and a current postdoc Ming Wang. And so what we want to understand is um, to establish a priori error estimate for neural network based methods for solving PDs in high dimension. So the motivation, I guess, is sort of clear probably to the everyone in the audience is that, uh, I mean, for many of these high dimensional PDs coming from various application fields, uh, the problem is very challenging because of the curse of dimensionality for conventional methods. I mean, so you quickly run into uh, I mean, impractical computational cost. But I mean, the hope is that using some of these recent events in machine learning that we can parameterize the uh, solution, the unknown functions to these PDs and try to I mean, buy new networks and then try to use some of these optimization methods to find a good approximation. And I guess that, I mean, I don't need really to introduce this, I mean, the idea to the audience here because I mean, that's the topic for the whole week. Um, so what the motivation, I mean, I just speak is that besides, of course, also like offer a efficient uh, strategy to solve these high dimensional PDs, I think also it's important to understand a little bit better from a mathematical uh, perspective, both the machine learning training, uh, both machine learning strategy in this well-controlled context, and also trying to understand a little bit better the theory of PDs in high dimension. Even though, of course, I mean, the theory of PD has been well developed for maybe uh, 100 years, uh, but many of the classical techniques are really designed for PDs in, I mean, low dimensions, like three dimensions or four dimensions. And I mean, once the dimension becomes higher, uh, there are still a lot of questions that remain to be answered. Okay. So uh, let me just briefly recall uh, what, I mean, kind of what we want to do, I mean, to set up the problem. And I mean, first of all, we want to parameterize the unknown functions, I mean, uh, by some finite degree of freedom on the computer. And then the approach is that we are going to find a suitable uh, like approximation within the ansatz. And the, I mean, just to keep the story short, and I mean, I guess because everyone is kind of familiar with the idea, I mean, the, in this talk, what we are going to talk about, uh, the functional approximation is kind of nonlinear approximation. You can keep in mind a neural network or in particular two linear neural networks. So something like a linear combination of activation function acting on uh, the uh, some vectors in a product with the X, where X could be in very high dimension, I'm thinking about for about 100 dimension, and then some uh, other coefficients, okay? I mean, also just to mention that, I mean, the, it's not only neural network that has been proposed to uh, as answers for solving these high dimensional PDs, and there are experts in this conference working on other methods, for example, tensor, uh, based methods and also uh, I mean, in the field of quantum chemistry, there have been actually many, many answers have been proposed for solving the many body uh, Schrodinger equation uh, using uh, different parameterizations of the wave functions. Okay. And after we fix a approximation class, which I would denote by uh, the curly F in this talk, uh, then the idea is that we set up a variational principle and try to uh, determine these parameters by minimizing the loss function as in machine learning. And the Particularly, I mean, it's just to fix the idea because I mean, we know that different PDs need different uh, numerical methods. Uh, to fix the idea, we are going to focus on the elliptic PDs in this talk. So uh, you can think about this PD, and uh, we will mention a little bit the more general uh, version of uh, a divergence form of the uh, of the PD as well. In the, I mean, towards the end of the talk, and also I mean, just for simplicity in the beginning, I mean. Uh, we will think about uh, easy boundary conditions. So it's a natural boundary condition and also the domain is kind of easy, it's hypercube. Okay. And now with this setup, it's sort of quite natural because this is elliptic PD. We know that um, it's a symmetric elliptic PD. We know that uh, the solution minimizes the energy function. Okay, so the basic idea, I mean, uh, 
what I mean numerical solving this PD, which is the same thing as uh, in finite element, for example, if you use the directional formulation, is that you write down the energy functional according uh, corresponding to this PD, which in this case is just the kinetic term plus the potential term times the U square, and then right hand side. And the solution, I mean, of the original PDE is given by the minimizer of this functional uh, within the class of H1. So this is a classical result. Okay. And now, I mean, since we, I mean, of course, the H1 is too large to optimize, I mean, when we're dealing with problems in very high dimension. So the idea would be that since we're going to approximate these high dimensional functions within the class of neural networks, let's say curly F, and the idea is that instead of finding for a solution within the whole class of H1, let's find a solution within this uh, parameterized class, okay, the neural networks. And this is just the classical risk allocation method idea applied to the neural network outsides. Okay, and this is, the method is known as deep risk method. All right. So I hope the setup is clear. Okay. And so now, I mean, so what I'm going to talk about or what we are thinking um, mainly uh, along these lines of work is that, I mean, so the method I mean, it's kind of nice. And also, I mean, there are plenty of numerical evidences. I mean, some of them presented in this conference to show that they are actually quite effective in high dimensions. But from a mathematical point of view, and we want to understand, uh, I mean, develop a more systematic error analysis of these methods. So the question is really when you try to quantify the error. And of course, if you open up a book on numerical PD, uh, what one would learn immediately is that, okay, so we need to think about the consistency error, which is the error of approximating the true solution within the neural network class, okay? And also we would hope that the numerical method is stable in the sense that, I mean, this is the, the best approximation that you can get in the class. And then the numerical method will produce you a solution that is close, I mean, that is not too bad. So it's kind of quasi optimal uh, compared with the best error that you could get. And then, I mean, obviously immediately these two combine together and we give you the convergence. So this is celebrated convergence, our consistency plus stability implies convergence, okay? And so just the one thing is that to remember is that in the context of, I mean, solving these high dimensional PDs in, using neural networks, there are actually some other parts of the error that comes in. In particular, because I mean, if we think about this variational principle and we are thinking about solving it uh, within the class of the neural networks. So we parameterize this U by neural network. And now if you want to solve it, then, I mean, you remember that you need to know at least the, the right-hand side here, right? the objective function. But remember that this objective function, I mean, so let me, I don't write down the whole thing, but for example, I mean, it's, well, I mean, let me write down the whole thing. It's something like this. And it's an integration in some very high dimensional space. So it's almost impossible to get, I mean, so given me a parameterization of the neural networks, it's almost impossible to get the objective function explicitly. Okay, I mean, by, in the sense that you can, uh, ex, sorry, in the sense that you can explicitly know these integrals. In other words, I mean, you have to come up with some approximation scheme. I mean, for example, in some Monte Carlo strategies as being discussed in earlier talks to approximate this integral. And then instead of uh, optimizing the original problem with this energy functional, you optimize, I mean, what you actually optimize is a surrogate version of the problem. So that I denote it by E of N, where N is sort of the indicator of the cost of the quadrature. So in the sense that you can think of that N is the number of Monte Carlo points that you're using to solve this problem. Okay. And so because of that, the actual minimizer that we have, I mean, from the optimizing the surrogate problem, is different from the actual minimizer that we have, and if we are able to solve the, uh, I mean, the energy function of minimizing that explicitly in the uh, in the ansatz of neural networks, so that actually gives us an error. And I mean, according to the machine learning, I mean, uh, consistent with the machine learning literature, that's kind of error of generalization. Okay, so this is generalization error, and all, but from a numerical analysis point of view. This is sort of like the error that is caused by numerical quadrature because you are approximating an integral by some, uh, for, for example, Monte Carlo points. Okay. And another subtle thing is that, I mean, even if you have replaced the original problem, which is almost impossible by some surrogate problem that is in principle possible to solve, the issue is still that, I mean, this optimization problem is highly non-convex and so that in practice, it's also very hard to guarantee that you find the optimum. So that, I mean, in reality, what you really need to actually, in the end of the day, to, uh, to estimate is the difference between the, opt I mean, the practical solution that you get from optimization algorithm with also the UN, that is, I mean, the true global minimum of this guy. Okay. 
And I mean, as we probably have seen a couple of times in this, uh, this workshop that actually this optimization error is actually quite difficult to deal with. Okay, in, I, mean, as, I mean, as long as you are talking about realistic neural networks, I mean, not in the linearized regime. And so of course there are, I mean, simplified situations that you can uh, linearize the problem as, I mean, for example, in the so-called neural tangent kernel regime that then, I mean, this becomes a linear problem, but in the re in like a, uh, Nonlinear scenarios, it's almost impossible to get. I mean, uh, get analysis. I mean, as so far, we don't have really the technical tools to do that. Okay, so we have seen these four errors: the approximation error, which is uh, talking about how la how far the true solution is from the neural network class, and stability, uh, which is sort of guaranteed if you're using a risk allocating type method or deep risk method, because that's I mean, the advantage of allocating risk is that the stability is just inherited from the PDE. Okay, and we, since we're talking about a uniform elliptic PD, so that the stability of that is a classical result, so that in other words, you can control the H1 norm by the energy difference or by the objective function difference. And so, 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 the, uh, so the conclusion will be that if you are able to minimize the objective function, the energy functional, then you will get a close solution to the true solution. Okay, so stability is fine. The generalization error, I mean, we need to think about the difference between the two uh, variational principle. And then the uh, one needs to worry about the optimization guarantee, okay? And as I said, the optimization guarantee is really difficult. So that I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't want to linearize the problem or to, to work in the uh, neural tangent regime or the kernel regime. So I mean, so in other words, I mean, so in this talk actually, uh, we are not going to uh, talk anything about the optimization guarantee. It's still a quite challenging area, and uh, I mean, a lot of work has to be done. So what we're going to focus on is the approximation and the generalization error, okay? So just to uh, remind, I mean, so that what we are just to remind everyone, so I mean, the generalization error, I mean, so that this is the minimum of the surrogate functional, which uh, uses, for example, some uh, uh, Monte Carlo approximation for the energy functional, while the U star is the true solution. So what, I mean, when we combine these two, so that this is the error that we want to estimate, okay, we choose the H1 metric, of course, because that's the natural norm for the elliptic PDE. And so you can, bump, because of stability, you can bound this using the energy difference so that you want to consider the, I mean, you can split this into two terms. So this is the approximation. Okay, so this is the asking about difference. So just remind you that UF is the minimum within the class of the neural networks. Okay, and so you are interested in the difference between the, uh, this, this is the generalization error, so that this is the minimum of a surrogate energy functional compared with the minimum of the true energy functional. And then this is approximation. So this is a difference between the approximation of the true solution you know, that works with the true solution. Okay. And clearly there's a trade-off because if you enlarge the functional class, then this approximation error can be I mean, getting uh, smaller and smaller since you can uh, better approximate the true solution since you have a larger class of functionals. But on the other hand, you can also understand that the generalization error may get worse if you use a larger class of function. Yes. I mean, the reason is because that if you think about, I mean, we, let's sort of fix some ideas. If you think about a Monte Carlo approximation for the quadrature, okay, so that, I mean, so this is your true functional, I mean, just written in the way of a, using expectation. And you do a Monte Carlo quadrature so that you replace this expectation by some sample average of taking ID points in the unit square. I mean, so I'm just being, uh, easy notation so that we assume the domain is a hypercube and so that the Monte Carlo is just the average. And then this, the, uh, the generalization error, because you do not know what the minimum is. So it's kind of related with the worst error of the numerical quadrature. Okay. And the worst error of the numerical quadrature of course becomes worse if you have a larger function class. Okay, so, and the challenge of the analysis or the challenging of choosing the architecture is oftentimes the balance between these two errors, the approximation and generalization error. All right, so now, I mean, I think uh, my time is uh, uh, clicking. And so now for the last, for the next half of the talk, I will just, uh, uh, I mean, so this is the basic framework and now we are going to uh, talk a little bit about the results that we have. So to address these trade-offs of errors and uh, I mean, uh, of these errors of generalization and approximation, uh, following the kind of the traditional thinking of numerical analysis. So the first step is of course, to set up a functional analysis framework. So to think about, in other words, to think about what kind of functioning space the true solution belongs to. Okay. So uh, by the way, there are a lot of works actually in this uh, in the literature of using neural networks or PDEs by trying to explicitly construct solutions of I mean 
uh, of the PDs using neural networks, uh, either by uh, simple cases that if the PD is simple so that we can write on a solution explicitly, or if the, I mean, for certain type of PDs, for example, parabolic PDs, you can use a Feynman cast type of uh, stochastic representations and then convert that into a neural network. This is, I mean, this is fine, but this is not really the, uh, the framework that we want to work with. So we really want to kind of work with more traditional file element style of numerical analysis. First, identify the function space to approximate these things in a more general setting, not try to construct the solution. And then uh, using the functional framework to analyze the error, okay? So, and then of course the question is that what kind of functional space? Uh, the obvious answer, I guess, is that if you're thinking about finite element is that, okay, so we should use, of course, the software for holder spaces that we are uh, extremely familiar with and we have all the tools available. And in particular that we have, like, we understand regularity of the PDE solutions in these spaces. And as I said, for example, the elliptic PDE, the solution has two lines in H1, okay? But the issue of these uh, things is that, I mean, also the reason that we want to use neural networks is that if you go to higher dimensions, uh, the problem of approximating something in H1 is that, I mean, you encounter the curse of dimensionality. So that yeah, I mean, these function spaces are basically just too large so that you need exponentially number of degree freedoms to approximate them, okay? And so that's why, I mean, even though that, I mean, there are a lot of theories developed, but they are kind of not suitable for the purpose that we have. I mean, so to, to analyze these things in very high dimension. And on the other hand, I mean, if you think starting from thinking about neural networks, then, I mean, one other direction to ask this question, I mean, of what function spaces to use is actually to ask what function spaces these neural network transmission corresponds to. Okay? And then at least for two layer neural networks, the natural function space that, I mean, can be approximated by two layer neural networks in high dimension is the so-called Baron type of spaces, which, I mean, the idea dates back to the Andrew Baron in 1993, but then it was also further developed in recent years uh, when the, uh, for people trying to understand approximation properties of neural networks. The advantage as I mean, because these things are really just directly motivated by neural networks so that they work quite well to understand the approximation of neural networks and also generalization. And also they work well I mean, in high dimension so that they, are, they don't suffer from the curse of dimensionality. But then the challenge is on the other hand that because these things are not regular, I mean, sub or not usual spaces that we're used to like the sub or holder spaces, and we essentially do not have much theory, I mean, of the PD solutions, I mean, for these functional spaces, okay? So that's sort of the goal that, I mean, uh, from the analysis point of view that we are trying to, uh, the main challenge that we are trying to overcome. So now let me give you some ideas of Baron spaces. And also let me uh, mention already that there are two types of Baron spaces and we have results in both. Uh, they're sort of connected, but sometimes it could be confusing. So let me, I mean, I will be specific that, I mean, so the main, Result that we have and talk about in this talk is the so-called spectral Baron space. So these are these spaces that is more kind of adapted to the original idea of Andrew Baron. So the basic, I mean, it's actually, I mean, if you haven't seen this before, you can think of it as you have thought of these spaces as just a weighted L1 space in the Fourier space. Okay. So basically, what we are doing here is that I mean, this is the definition of the space. So you first do a cosine transform. I mean, this is related with the boundary condition that we choose for the domain and for the function, okay? So, and then you denote the U hat K as the cosine transform expansion coefficients. So it's just like the Fourier coefficients if you're thinking about the whole domain. And then the Baron space, the spectral Baron space is essentially defined. So if you replace this, I mean, if you put two here, then this is just a normal uh, HK space, HS space, okay? So instead of doing that, in the Baron definition, we replace the L2 by L1. Okay, so it's a weighted L1 uh, kind of norm of the Fourier coefficients. And then these Ks are just the, the wave numbers so that these things are put in there. So the S is just to indicate the differentiability or the smoothness of these functions because we are working on PDE so that we're thinking about taking derivatives. Okay, so that's why in the usual Baron space, this S is equal to one. And, but for us, it's more convenient to have a uh, variable uh, indicator of the regularity. So the usual Baron space actually, just to, uh, if you haven't seen this, is that, I mean, defined in this uh, paper by Andrew Baron is the weighted, I mean, L1 average of the Fourier transform function that defined the whole space. And it's sort of a celebrated result of the universal approximation theorem that if a function is in the Baron space, then you can uh, use a neural network, two layer neural network to approximate it with approximation error, it goes down as one over the, uh, one over the number of neurons. Okay. 
So now, I mean, this is function space. And so, I mean, to find this space, I can uh, state our main result is that, I mean, we sort of developed a new uh, solution theory for PDEs in this class. So that, I mean, so this is, uh, by the way, I should emphasize that what we're aiming at is a priori estimate. So as in the usual a priori estimate of numerical analysis, so the first step is we establish that the true solution lies in some function space. And then we say that this function space can be approximated well by neural networks. Okay, there are also results of, uh, about a post theory error estimate, or, or I mean, there are also some results of neural networks approximation by assuming that the functions uh, lies in some good space. But I mean, that's not what we're trying to do here. I mean, our main focus is actually the irregularity estimate, the priori estimate. Okay, so the uh, results stated in a, in a way is that if you forget about these barren spaces, this is sort of a completely classical result that you would expect in a sense that if you replace the barren space by the sublift space, okay, so you're thinking that if our PDE satisfies some regularity conditions, so that for example, the right hand side is in some class, and you want to say that the solution will gain to twice the returns, okay? So this is actually the content of this theorem, so that the solution, the U star of this PDE in the space in the barrel S plus two norm can be controlled by the barrel norm of the right hand side and the barrel S norm, okay? So as I said, if you replace these things by sublift like HS and this is HS plus two, then this is of course what cannot expect it. And I mean, this is the analog of that theory. I mean, in this space of the barrel space, okay? And also let me just mention that, I mean, uh, if, I mean, for people who are familiar with the PD, I guess it's not surprising that you need to assume something for this potential and the right-hand side. Otherwise, there is no hope that the solution lies in some good functional spaces. Okay, I mean, for example, if right-hand side is just L2, then the solution is at most H2. And I mean, it's not going to be well approximated in high dimension. Okay, I don't think I have time to go over the proof, but I mean, just the one thing that I need to mention is that since these things, I mean, are not like the usual Hilbert spaces that we're used to, so that we cannot use the usual tricks like Lux Milgram and so on. So we have to develop some new analysis uh, frameworks for, for uh, doing things in these spaces. And in particular for this problem, we use the Fredholm alternative, I mean, to, uh, to show the existence of solutions and to show regularity. And I mean, so these actually, I mean, uh, it's, I think it's a very interesting research direction trying to analyze, I mean, developing tools uh, for analysis, analysis of these high-dimensional PDEs, I mean, so the right functional analysis tools. Okay, so I think uh, there is a question. So is there assumption on the boundary? So yeah, that's a good question. So that here for simplicity, actually our boundary is quite simple. So that this is, the domain here is just the, the, uh, the, the hypercube. And now, I mean, as you can imagine, if the boundary, if the domain is not nice, and if it has corners and so on, then this becomes much more challenging. And also the regularity results may fail. I hope that answered the question. All right. So I think uh, I have some time left. I mean, so that one thing that is almost immediate, I mean, after getting these uh, appropriate estimates of the P solution is that now you can apply the sort of the more or less standard uh, machine learning of uh, analysis of neural networks, trying to ad address the approximation and generalization error after identify the functional space. And this is sort of the, uh, the result we get. This part is generalization so that it decays as the Monte Carlo rate of the number of samples you choose in the Monte Carlo scheme. And this is approximation, which is one over M. So, I mean, these kind of rates are classically expected uh, from the general theory of uh, neural network approximations. And then, I mean, I'm just showing you some numerical results saying that, I mean, indeed, we observe this kind of trade off between approximation and generalization. This is a very simple problem and in, in higher dimension, but um, because the solution is extremely simple, I mean, we cook up the problem so that we can write down the solution explicitly. And you can see that, I mean, here we fix the number of sample points. The n is fixed and we vary the width of the neural networks. And you can see that the first, the error decays to some part, and then the error starts to increase. And the dashed line is what's being predicted. I mean, the rates predicted by our theorem. I'm not claiming that the rates are sharp, but at least it kind of fit the trend pretty well. And now uh, for the remaining time, let me just briefly mention two other results that we have. So that, I mean, the previous result we have is for elliptic PDEs. And we can extend these results to eigenvalue problems. So that now if you have a high dimensional pro eigenvalue problem, so this is more close to the Schrodinger uh, type of questions coming from quantum mechanics that I'm originally interested in from uh, this uh, serial study. 
So we have the kinetic energy plus potential, and we're interested in the smallest eigenfunction, uh, small, I mean, the eigenstar eigenfunction corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue of the problem, so the ground state. And we also, I mean, set up just to simplify problem, we set up the problem in a simple domain with simple boundary conditions. And what we were able to prove is that if the potential is in the Baron S class, then you can show that the eigenfunction, the leading eigenfunction of this problem is also in the Baron space with two more regularity. Okay. And I mean, again, this is, I mean, you may think of this as, I mean, you want to set up a Crown Fisher principle and things like that to solve the problem. But because of the nature of the Baron space, that we actually need to address this problem from a very different function analysis framework using uh, Banner space fixed point theorems. Okay. And now, I mean, based on these results, you can also get, I mean, an analogous to what we had before, the uh, the, the priori estimate of the generalization and approximation error. And I'm just stating this result in high probability fashion, which I mean, also, I mean, the previous result was stated in expectation sense, uh, but these results can be obtained. I mean, uh, I mean, both versions can be obtained. And also, uh, as I mentioned that, uh, there was actually another version of the Baron space that I mean, is based on the integral representation, which is more directly related with neural networks. Because if you think about neural network, if you send the, I mean, if you think about the number of neurons n and you send that to infinity, okay, so that's, for example, this is a neural network and you send n to infinity, I mean, this is like the mean field limit, then what you will expect is that, I mean, in the end, it converges to something like this, where this row gives us the measure of these parameters. Okay, and now this has can, I mean has been used and proposed to be used as a definition of a functional space. I mean, which is the uh, as I call the integral representation based upon a space uh, in recent years by Francis Bach, Wiener Er, and uh, students. And also, I mean, we extend a little bit of these things in our paper. And this is the norm. Sorry, the curly bracket is missing. Okay, so we can also actually work on this space. Uh, but it's actually slightly more difficult to work on this space than the uh, the cosine spaces that we um, we had before because I mean we cannot use Fourier transforms and so on. Okay, and now this is a recent results that uh, Zhang and uh, Yudong and we uh, work together and which is uh, accept just accepted in NeurIPS as a spotlight paper. So uh, what we can show is that if you consider elliptic PDE in Rn, so that there is no boundary at all, and now I mean of course D has to be uh, strictly positive, so that's which should make sense in L two. Okay, and what we can show is that uh, it's slightly difficult to show actually the solution is lies in the Baron space, but what we can show is that it can be approximated arbitrarily well. Okay, so if you give me error criteria epsilon, that you can approximate the solution and up to this error, uh, this I mean up to error epsilon with the Baron norm of this approximation controlled by this. Okay, so I don't think I have any time to go into the proofs of these things, but uh, if you're interested, you can uh, you can talk with me later. Okay, so as just summary, uh, so this is what I talk about. There are many, many uh, future interesting directions in this area, I think, I mean, which I haven't, uh, I mean, we, we are working on these things, but I think it's a really exciting area that I would encourage uh, more people to come in and to think about the functional analysis framework for these uh, high dimensional PDEs. Okay, and uh, I mean, more general uh, process neural, neural network architectures and uh, to improve these numerical methods as we discussed in this conference. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And oh, so, somehow the one of reference is missing. I mean, I didn't maybe didn't compile after that, but I mean, you can find all these papers on our archive or on my website. Thank you all. And please let me know. Thank if you, you very that. much, uh, Tian Feng, for this very nice talk. Uh, we have time for maybe a couple of questions. Are there any questions from the audience? There's a question from Carl Kunish. Please uh, unmute yourself and speak. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Interesting. To listen, um, my, probably the, my question is not really your focus, but nonetheless, I mean you are talking about minimizers, but it's not clear whether they exist, right? They are infimizers. Towards the uh, beginning of your talk. Yeah, that's actually. I mean, what we show that it exists in a way because I mean we show that the solution lies in the barrel space, right? So mm -hmm. that, I mean, in other words, you can. I mean, if you think about the minimum of, I mean, depending on what kind of function class you choose, of course. But if you think about the minimum of u in this, I mean, let's say in the barrel space s plus two yeah. of omega of this functional, and what we we're showing is that if you're, I mean, using the uh, this regularity results. Right, so that I mean, you actually show that this is indeed just the true solution, 
because the true solution lies in this class and the true solution gives you the energy zero, right? So that uh, and you can interpret the result in this way. Once you're at this level, I agree. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, but I mean, of course, without this, I mean, then uh, I mean, then you have to uh, be more careful, right? So that I mean, one, yeah, I agree with you that I mean, certainly it's I mean, when we uh, set up these problems in Ethereum, uh, then we need to make sure, for example, it's bounded from below and things like that. And the companions. But maybe uh, then a um, more interesting question would be can you allow constraints on the coefficients? Uh, you mean Ask something like little yeah. electricity constraints? Uh, we, I mean, so in some sense, uh, when we set up the problem, if it's, I mean, if you fi uh, fix it to be finite dimensional, right? So, for example, if your neural network is 100 parameters, and then you can certainly say that all these parameters stays in some finite range, and that automatically compactifies the problem, right? So that is even better than, than the original problem, if that's what you mean. But I mean, but you could also consider some very non trivial constraints, which I didn't have time to talk. For example, you can say that uh, I want my function uh, to satisfy some directly boundary condition at a boundary with some non trivial uh, values. And that is more difficult, right? So that what people usually do in this context is to penalize that using a soft penalty, sure, like by yeah. imposing something. Or, I mean, you could think about, I mean, in certain cases, you could build that into the ansatz, but that's, I mean, sometimes it's feasible, but I mean, it depends on the problem. Thank you very much. I know that Mario has a question, but Mario, can we, uh, we have to go to the next talk. So okay. you can, can I just have a, a short okay. question okay, uh, concerning short coming, coming back to the, uh, to this question on the boundary. I, I was more wondering whether you need structural uh, assumptions, like uh, having a tensor product uh, uh, domain or a tensor product structure in the boundary, because uh, it, otherwise uh, the structure of the burn space uh, might get lost. Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, for this specific proof, actually, we need that. Uh, we need, uh, because it's a cosine series, right? So that if right. you change your domain to something arbitrary, then certainly, I mean, this cosine series will be very different. I, we are I currently working that on- The something. solution is not in the barren space anymore for general- Yeah, domain. I mean, because our definition of the barren space, I mean, for this problem is adapted to the domain yes. uh, for the cosine space. And now, I mean, the other definition, which I goes back in, uh, which I goes to briefly mention in the end, Actually, that does not uh, relies on a domain because I mean you can, sorry for the. Okay, this is, uh, so you can have this space in any domain that you have, and I mean right now we don't have results for arbitrary domain, but we are working on something on that. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so this result is actually for the whole space. I mean the theorem that uh, we uh, we quoted here. Thank you very thanks much. Thanks for the question. It's, it's really let's, good. Uh, let's thank Jianfeng and let's go. Switch